Welcome. I am going to continue reading from Nectar in a Sieve. This is part two. Change I had known before, and it had been gradual. My father had been a headman once, a person of consequence in our village. I had lived to see him relinquish the importance, but the alteration was so slow that we hardly knew when it came. I had seen both my parents sink into old age and death, and here too there was no violence. But the change that now came into my life, into all our lives, blasting its way into our village, seemed wrought in the twinkling of an eye. Arjun came running to us with the news. He had run all the way from the village, and we had to wait while he gulped in fresh air. Hundred, hundreds of men, he gasped. They're pulling down houses around the maiden, and there's a long line of bullet carts carrying bricks. The other children clustered round him, their eyes popping. Arjun swelled with importance. I'm going back, he announced. There's a lot to be seen. Nathan looked up from the grain he was measuring into the gunny bag for storing. It is the new tannery they're building, he said. I had heard rumors. Um, just for reference, tannery is a workshop where animal hides are turned into leather goods. Arjun, torn between a desire to dash back and a craving to hear more from his father, teetered anxiously to and fro on his heels, but Nathan said no more. He put the grain away carefully in the granary, then he rose. Come, he said, we will see. All the families were out. The news had spread quickly. Kali and her husband Kunti and her boys Janaki surrounded by her numerous family. Even old granny had come out to see. Children were everywhere, dodging in and out of the crowd and crying out to each other in shrill, excited voices. Startled pie dogs added to the din. Let's see if it says what pie dogs are. Stray dogs. All right, that makes sense. Startled pie dogs added to the din. We formed a circle about the first arrivals, some 50 men or so, who were unloading bricks from the bullock carts. They spoke in our language, but with the intonation, which made it difficult for us to understand them. Townspeople, Kali whispered to me, they say they have traveled more than 100 miles to get here. She was prone to exaggerate and also believed whatever was told her. In charge of the men was an overseer who looked and spoke like the men, but who was dressed in a shirt and trousers. And he had a hat on his head, such as I had only seen Kenny wear before, a topi the color of thatch. The others wore loincloths and turbans, and a few wore shirts, but as the day wore on, they doffed their shirts one by one, until all were, see were as our men. Doff just means they took off their shirts. The men worked well and quickly, with many a sidelong glance at us. They seemed to enjoy having created such a stir and lured such a big audience. As for the overseer, he made much play of his authority, directing them with a loud voice and many gestures, but not, but doing not a stroke of work himself. Still, it must have been hot for him standing there waving his arms about, for the shirt he wore was sticking to his back now, and he would lift his hat as if to allow the wind to cool his scalp. Until at last there was a commotion about the edges of the circle of which we were the inner ring. The crowd was parting, And as the movement spread to us, we gave way too, to let a tall white man through. He had on a white topi and was accompanied by three or four men dressed like him in shorts. The overseer now came forward, bowing and scraping, and the red-faced one spoke to him rapidly, but so low that we could not hear what he was saying. The overseer listened respectfully and then began telling us to go, not to disturb the men, although for so long he had been glad of the watchers. In our maiden, in our village, he stood let it, telling us to go. As if he owned us, mother, muttered Kanan the Chakli. I think that already he foresaw his livelihood being wrested from him, for he salted and tanned his own skins, making them into chaplets for those in the village who wore them. So he stood his ground, glaring at the overseer and refusing to move, as did a few others who, represent, who resented the haughty orders that poured from the man's lips, but most of us went having our own concerns to mind. Every day for two months, the line of bullock carts came in laden with bricks and stones and cement, sheets of tin and corrugated iron, coils of rope and hemp. The kilns in the neighboring villages were kept busy firing the bricks, but their output was insufficient, and the carts had to go farther afield, returning dusty and brick-filled. Day and night, women twisted ropes since they could sell as much as they made, 
and traders waxed prosperous selling their goods to the workmen. They were very well paid, these men, some of their, them earning two rupees in a single day, whereas even in good times we seldom earned as much, and they bought lavishly rice and vegetables and dolls, sweetmeats and fruit. Around the maiden they built their huts, for there was no other place for them, and into these brought their wives and children, making a community of their own. At night we saw their fires, and by day we heard their noise, loud, ceaseless, clangor and din, chatter, sometimes a chanting to help them get a heavy beam into position or hoist a load of sheet of tin sheeting to the roof a load of tin sheeting to the roof. Then one day the building was completed. The wor workers departed, taking with them their goods and chattels, leaving only the empty huts behind. There was a silence. In the unwanted quiet, we all wondered apprehensively what would happen next. A week went by and another. Losing our awe, we entered the building, poking into its holes and corners, looking into the great vats and drums that had been installed. Then curiosity slaked, we set about our old tasks on the land and in our homes. There were some among the traders, those who had put up their prices and made their money, who regretted their going. Not I. They had invaded our village with clatter and din, had taken from us the maiden where our children played, and had made the bazaar prices too high for us. I was not sorry to see them go. They will be back, said Nathan, my husband. Or others will take their place. And did you not benefit from their stay, selling your pumpkins and plantains for better prices than you did before? Yes, said I, for I had. But what could I buy with the money with the prices so high everywhere? No sugar or doll or ghee have we tasted since they came. And should we have had none so long as they, and should have had none so long as they remained? Nevertheless, said Nathan, they will be back, for you may be sure they did not take so much trouble only to leave a shell in our midst. Therefore, it is well to accept these things. Never, never, I cried. They may, live in our, they may live in our midst, but I can never accept them, for they lay their hands upon us, and we are all turned from tilling to barter, and hoard our silver, since we cannot spend it, and see our children go without the food that their children gorge. And it is only in the hope that one day things will be as they were that we have done these things. Now that they have gone, let us forget them and return to our ways. Foolish woman, Nathan said, there is no going back. Bend like the grass that you do not break. Our children had not seen us so serious, so vehement before. Three of my sons huddled together in a corner, staring at us with wide eyes. The two youngest lay asleep, one in Ira's arms, the other leaning heavily against her, and she herself sagged against the wall with their weight as she sat there on their floor. There was a look on her lovely, soft face that pierced me. Ah, well, I said, dissembling, perhaps I exaggerate. If they return, we shall have a fine dowry for our daughter, and that is indeed a good thing. The lost look went from Ira's face. She was a child still, despite the ripeness of her 13 years, and no doubt fancied a grand wedding, even as I had done. They came back, not the same men who went, but others, and not all at once, but slowly. The red-faced white man came back with a foreman and took charge of everything. He did not live in the village, but came and went, while his men took over the huts that had lain empty. The ones who came last settling beside the river, bringing their wives and children with them, or dotting the maiden even more quick, thickly with the huts they built for themselves and their families. I went back to my home, thankful that a fair distance still lay between them and us, that although the smell of their brews and liquors hung permanently in the sickened air, Still their noise came to us from afar. You are a queer being, Kunti said, her brows flaring away from her eyes. Are you not glad that our village is no longer a clump of huts, but a small town? Soon there will be shops, tea stalls, even a bioscope. <coughs> Such as I have been to before I was married, you will see. No doubt I will, I said, it will not gladden me. Already my children hold their noses when they go by. And all is shouting and disturbances and crowds wherever you go. Even the birds have forgotten to sing, or else their calls are lost to us. You are a village girl, said Kunti, and there were shadows of contempt moving behind her eyes. You do not understand. If I was a village girl, Kali and Janaki were too, and had no taste for the intruders. But after a while, Janaki confessed that at least she knew, now knew what to do with her sons, for the land could not take them all. 
And as for Kali, well, she had always been fond of an audience for her stories. So they were reconciled and threw the past away with both hands that they might be the readier to grasp the present, while I stood by in pain, envying such easy reconciliation and clutching in my own two hands the memory of the past and accounting it a treasure. I think the end of my daughter's carefree days began with the tannery. She had been used to come and go with her brothers and they went and they went whither they wished. Then one day with many a meaningful wink, Kali told us that it was time we looked to our daughter. She is maturing fast, she said. Do you not see the eyes of the young men lighting on her? If you are not careful, you will not find it easy to get her a husband. My daughter is no wanton, Nathan replied. Not only men, but women look at her, for she is beautiful. She is that, Kali said handsomely. Therefore, look to her even, sorry about that. Look, therefore, look to her even more closely. There was no subduing Kali as well I knew. Thereafter, although we did not admit it to each other, we were more careful of Ira. Poor child, she was bewildered by the many injunctions we laid upon her, and the curtailing of her freedom tried her sorely, though not a word of complaint came from her. And that is the end of the story. Thank you for being here.